For every age group, relatively low LDL is associated with an increased mortality risk from cardiovascular disease. So this is data from a study of about 14.9 million people that weren't taking lipid-lowering medication. So for every age group, starting with 18-year-olds and all the way up to 99-year-olds, we can see that for LDL in the 100 to about 120 milligram per deciliter range, that's associated with lowest risk for cardiovascular disease-related mortality. However, with lower LDL, as shown by the red arrows, we can see increased mortality risk from CVD. So the big question is why? So to gain some insight, let's take a look at how LDL changes during aging, which is shown here. So with the data for men in green and women in red, we can see that LDL increases during aging up until about the 50s, and then it declines. Now note that relatively low LDL is found in youth. So why would low LDL be associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk or an increased cardiovascular disease mortality risk? That seems paradoxical. So to gain more insight, let's take a look at some data from patients that had coronary artery disease, CAD. And that data is here, published in a paper earlier this year, Non-HDL Cholesterol Paradox and the Effect of Underlying Malnutrition in Patients with Coronary Artery Disease. And this was a study that included uh, almost 42,000 people. So let's define some terms. So first, what is the non-HDL cholesterol paradox? So that's when low levels of non-HDL cholesterol are associated with an increased CVD mortality risk. All right, so what about non-HDL cholesterol? What is that? So that's when uh, total, uh, that equals total cholesterol, TC, minus HDL, or more specifically, LDL plus VLDL plus intermediate density lipoprotein, IDL. Now, IDL is a very minor component of this equation in terms of concentration, so I won't focus on it in this video, focusing instead on LDL and VLDL, which are almost exclusively uh, non-HDL cholesterol, or make up the majority of it. So first, relatively low VLDL is associated with a reduced risk for cardiovascular disease-related mortality, and that's what's shown here. So we're looking at the risk for acute myocardial infarction, so heart attack, sudden coronary death, and other coronary death in association with the VLDL cholesterol concentration. So for people that had less than 20 for VLDL, when compared with higher levels of VLDL 20 to 29 and greater than 30, we can see that having a low VLDL was associated with lowest risk for these cardiovascular disease-related outcomes when compared with higher levels of VLDL, which had a significantly increased risk as shown there. So from this, we can conclude that because low VLDL is associated with a reduced cardiovascular disease mortality risk, not an increased uh, CVD mortality risk as um, shown by the non-HDL cholesterol paradox, the non-HDL cholesterol paradox would then mostly involve LDL. So just keep that in mind uh, as we go forward. So then why is low non-HDL uh, cholesterol significantly associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk in coronary artery disease patients? To start to address that, let's take a look at the association between non-HDL cholesterol with all-cause mortality risk, and that's what's shown here. So note that this study involved uh, people with an average age of 65, and that it was 80% men included in the study. So first, note that lowest all-cause mortality risk in this subject population uh, had a non-HDL cholesterol level of 4 to 5 millimolar, which is approximately 155 to 193 milligrams per deciliter. But then we can see that non-HDL cholesterol paradox there. So less than 85 for the non-HDLC was significantly associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk in coronary artery disease patients. But note that this is an unadjusted association, and there are many other factors that may impact this association. So it's important to account for those variables in this model. So what happens to all-cause mortality risk when this association includes adjustment for other health-related variables. So what are those variables that can impact the association? And they include an older age, uh, sex, other CVD-related comorbidities, uh, AFib or atrial fib fibrillation, high blood pressure, hypertension, elevated blood glucose is indicated by type 2 diabetes, poor, ki poor kidney function is indicated by chronic kidney disease, CKD, which was more specifically an EGFR less than 60, uh, anemia as indicated by the uh, relatively low concentration of red blood cells in blood, uh, is indicated by the hematocrit levels, and uh, lung disease is indicated by COPD, uh, chronic uh, obstructive pulmonary disease. So when, these, when this association includes these variables, now the sum of the risk has gone away. So we can see that although uh, it's still significant, the lowest all-cause mortality risk for a relatively higher non-HDLC is right at the border of statistical significance. And similar, similarly, the 
lower non-HDLC, that increased risk has also been reduced by a bit as we can see that the confidence interval is right at the border of statistical significance. So from this, we can conclude that age, sex, and comor comorbidities affect the relationship between non-HDL cholesterol with all-cause mortality risk in coronary artery disease patients. But note that the title of this paper includes malnutrition. So how does malnutrition contribute to the association for non-HDL cholesterol with all-cause mortality risk? So first, how did they define malnutrition? So they included blood test data for albumin, lymphocytes, and total cholesterol. And then also as a quick aside, note that because this, the association for non-HDL cholesterol with all-cause mortality risk, uh, because total cholesterol includes non-HDL cholesterol, the only other component that isn't included is HDL. So by including total cholesterol in these models, it's essentially accounting for HDL. So what happens to all-cause mortality risk when the association for non-HDL cholesterol with all-cause mortality is adjusted for malnutrition as defined by these three factors? And now we're looking at, it looks like a totally different curve. So after accounting for albumin, lymphocytes, and total cholesterol, non, uh, higher uh, non-HDL cholesterol, so greater than 85 milligrams per deciliter, is now associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. And conversely, the non-HDL cholesterol paradox is gone so that we see that having a non-HDL cholesterol of less than 85 milligrams per deciliter is now associated, significantly associated with a reduced all-cause mortality risk in coronary artery disease patients. So from this, we can conclude that malnutrition may be driving the effect of a low non-HDL cholesterol on all-cause mortality risk in CAD patients. So before going forward, it's important to also account for those other uh, factors that could uh, impact this this association, including age, sex, and comorbidity. So what happens to this plot if those variables are included in the malnutrition model? So that's what we can see here. And the data looks almost uh, essentially the same with very, some very small changes. We can still see that having a non-HDL cholesterol level greater than 85 is still significantly associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. And then that uh, the non-HDL cholesterol paradox is uh, still... Uh, it's, it's now reversed. I mean, you still see that reduced all-cause mortality risk. Granted, it's right at the border of statistical significance. You can see that the confidence interval, the red dashed lines, are right at a hazard ratio of one. But nonetheless, we can see that uh, malnutrition may be driving the effect of having a low non-HDL cholesterol on all-cause mortality risk, at least in this uh, subject population, coronary artery disease patients. So the big question, though, is why? Why would malnutrition drive the effect of low non-HDL cholesterol, or more specifically, potentially LDL, on all-cause mortality risk. So note that having low levels of albumin, lymphocytes, and HDL are a part of the aged phenotype. So let's take a look at that data. And I presented this in other videos, so I'm going to kind of fly through this. Uh, but if you've missed it, just uh, do a search for albumin, lymphocytes, and HDL on my, on my channel, and you can get more in-depth uh, breakdowns. So albumin levels are high in youth, but decline during aging. So we're looking at uh, levels of, serum levels of albumin on the y-axis plotted against age all the way up to 100 years. And we can see that albumin levels peak in youth from values of about 46 in men uh, and 45 in women and then declined to about 36 grams per liter in 100-year-olds. So what's the importance of having youthful levels of albumin? So we can assess that by looking at all-cause mortality risk, which is, which is what's shown here. Uh, hazard ratio for all-cause mortality on the y-axis plotted against the albumin co concentration on the x. And we can see that lowest all-cause mortality risk is uh, associated with an albumin level that's found in youth, 46 grams per liter. And then as the albumin concentration declines, as found in aging, we see that significantly increased all-cause mortality risk as indicated by the red lines. Similarly, lymphocytes are high in youth, but also decline during aging, as shown here. So levels of lymphocytes on the y-axis, again, plotted versus age, all the way up to 100 years. And with the red line, we can see that lymphocytes decline during aging. So just like the album data, what's the importance of having youthful levels of lymphocytes? So we can assess that by looking at all-cause mortality risk, as shown there. That's on the y-axis plotted against the lymphocyte count on the x. And we can see that lowest all-cause mortality risk is associated with having 2 trillion lymphocytes per liter, as shown there by the, that little, the uh, vertical black lines uh, on the x-axis. But then, as lymphocyte levels decline, we can see that's, again, significantly increased all-cause mortality risk. Now, as I mentioned earlier, malnutrition also included total cholesterol. And because we're looking at the association for non-HDL cholesterol with all-cause mortality risk, this becomes an HDL story because total cholesterol equals non-HDL cholesterol plus HDL, as HDL is the only factor that's not included in that model. 
So HDL also is high in youth, relatively high in youth, but also declines during aging as shown here. So HDL peaks in youth from values of about 64 in women and 56 in men, and then steadily declines during aging for women as shown there. And then for men, there's a pretty rapid decline into the about the 30s, after which it's mostly uh, uh, stable in the low 50s afterwards, all the way up to 80, 88 years, the uh, endpoint age, uh, age range on this plot. So relatively low HDL is also associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk, as shown here with this all-cause mort mortality plot. So uh, it, for values less than 45 for men and less than 55 for women, we can see that HDL, uh, we can see an increased uh, all-cause mortality risk for relatively lower levels of HDL. So to bring it back to the original question, why is LDL less than 100 to 120 milligrams per deciliter associated with an increased mortality risk from cardiovascular disease? So L low LDL within the context of low albumin, lymphocytes, and HDL, which is defined as malnutrition, that also equals the aged phenotype. So that collectively could potentially explain the increased cardiovascular uh, mortality risk when in the context of low LDL. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.